Thank you so much, Chris. Uh, and thank you, uh, David, for putting together this wonderful symposium. It's great to be part of it. Very exciting to be here, to hear some of the history, to uh, see some uh, friends of long standing. Um, and uh, for then, uh, we have a disclosure, uh, and that's that we were residents in 1967 when this paper was uh, published. And Bill Northway, we had to, had to go and look at x-rays first before you could look at the babies. And uh, we taught us about uh, babies and x-rays and lungs. But he also taught us about discovery and commitment and loving what you do. Uh, and we thank him and all those at Stanford who contributed to our doing that. Uh, in addition, we had uh, two wonderful model mentors in uh, John Clements, who you've heard about here today, and Mary Ellen Avery, uh, who helped model for us the idea of bench to bedside and how one might collaborate uh, in working ahead. As you've heard, death from uh, RDS has changed markedly since the introduction of surfactant. Uh, but in spite of that, we still have BPD. But as Alan has so eloquently described, that's because we keep saving smaller and smaller babies and doing more and more. Um, we also uh, have to have a slide like this. We all have one similar to this uh, that tries to demonstrate how multifactorial uh, BPD is. And here we've highlighted surfactant on ours um, uh, so that you can see that we have the developmental problem of surfactant deficiency. But in addition, with all the things we do to these babies, we also end up uh, with surfactant dysfunction uh, later, uh, which we think contributes to the development of BPD. So initially, I was asked to give this talk. Uh, and uh, you know, I'm not the one who's been in the laboratory uh, studying surfactant. And uh, I got a little concerned about that. And I thought Dr. Sunshine might say, but where's the beef? And um, therefore, uh, Phil is going to participate in this and tell you about some of the science behind the trials that we've done in our collaboration. And I'll come back and talk about that later. Great. Thanks, Roberta. That was a compliment, I think. <laughs> uh, and good morning to everyone. So. Uh, I'm going to carry on with the bench, some of the bench observations. Let me go back to the model here. So uh, anyway, I'm going to be old school and uh, focus over here if you want to see the pointer as, as I go along. So I'd like to review some of the observations from the bench. Uh, and I'm going to focus initially on the role of the two hydrophobic surfactant proteins that are critical for surfactant function in vitro. Uh, and we now know uh, in vivo as well. And then I'll discuss some new data relating the relationship between this acquired secondary surfactant deficiency and uh, the topic of, of the day. So in our earlier studies, we initially wanted to address the ontogeny of surfactant proteins, particularly SPB and SPC, uh, in the uh, premature infant uh, postnatally. Uh, and we did this by collecting tracheal aspirates from a number of infants, and we sorted out those samples that had normal surfactant function in vitro and measured SPB and SPC. And as you can see, we uh, found a, a plateau from two to nine weeks for B, and uh, only later did SPC come up and reach uh, these levels. And these levels turn out to be very comparable to what we find in adult surfactant. Now, to measure uh, the proteins in the first couple, first few days uh, after birth, we um, found infants that received exosurf rather than another uh, natural surfactant. And as you know, this is a synthetic surfactant that does not contain SBB or SPC. Uh, and thus, we can measure the endogenous levels of these two proteins and note that they are really low uh, compared uh, to uh, later in the uh, uh, course. The second observation, use, again using infants, uh, established a relationship between the levels of surfactant protein B, shown here, and the minimum surface tension, an index of surfactant function. Uh, 
values less than five are considered normal. So with low uh, SPB levels, you can see abnormal surfactant, and only when you get above about a half percent of SPB uh, do we uh, find most of these samples uh, now have normal function. So really a, a striking uh, dose dependency. The third observation uh, from these infants was looking at this, the occurrence of acquired surfactant deficiency. And to do this, we looked again over time in surfactant samples collected from different infants, measured the uh, minimum surface tension, uh, and found that between about 35 and 50 percent of the infants on any given week postnatally had an episode of surfactant deficiency, and we found that these were associated with respiratory decompensations, crumps we used to call them, uh, and infections. Now, uh, studies in animals uh, support this uh, proposal of uh, the importance of SPB, and this is perhaps the most elegant uh, report from the Cincinnati group. They used a, a mouse, transgenic mouse, conditionally expressing SPB uh, when it was uh, on doxycycline. And as you can see, if you take the mouse off this drug, a dramatic and rapid decrease in SPB levels. It's a selective decrease as SPC uh, does not change. During this time in, in these animals, there was 49% mortality. So a very dramatic uh, response to losing their SPB. As expected, uh, off doxycycline, minimum surface tension increases, surfactant is not functional, this is reversible. There's inflammation in the lung. There's an increase in protein in the uh, BAL and an increase in inflammatory cells and an increase uh, in uh, cytokines. So in a, a prompt inflammatory response uh, in this uh, situation. So to briefly summarize um, of this part, most intubated infants are deficient in SPB and SPC for at least one to two weeks. The low content of SPB in particular is highly associated with abnormal surf surfactant uh, function. Uh, many of these chronically ventilated premature infants, and all the data I've shown are from intubated infants so that we can make the tracheal aspirate collection, uh, have abnormal uh, surfactant function on one or more occasion during their hospitalization. These are associated with respiratory decompensations and infections. And I think this all supports the concept that an acquired secondary uh, insufficiency of surfactant uh, is related to uh, lung disease. Now, these data and others provided rationale for thinking about a clinical approach to uh, uh, replacing surfactant or replacing SPB uh, as a, a therapy for preventing uh, BPD. We considered a number of possibilities. For, for practical reasons, we focused on giving booster late installations of surfactant. Uh, after a pilot study, this led to a large multi-center uh, trial. Our leader was Roberta. Uh, I was in the lab, of course. Uh, we called this a TOLSURF trial of late surfactant to prevent BPD. Just briefly, um, we enrolled uh, 511 uh, infants from about 22 different centers. Uh, they received either up to five late doses of surfactant uh, at about a 48-hour interval with some uh, variability, or a sham procedure, and all of the infants received inhaled uh, nitric oxide. Infants were eligible if they were less than 28 weeks and intubated at 7 to 14 days. And for the laboratory studies that I'll uh, present next, we collected tracheal aspirates before each dose of surfactant. A quick look, we enrolled uh, for this study 209 of the 511 infants. For laboratory studies, we ran out of time and money at that point. Uh, you can see that they're well matched in terms of risk factors and the various uh, demographics. Uh, survival was similar at 36 weeks in the two groups, with a trend toward improved survival at uh, 40 weeks. And R Roberto will expand on this uh, briefly. So we took the uh, uh, 
tracheal aspirates, we isolated large aggregate, and this is the active subtype of surfactant. Uh, we assayed the total amount of surfactant recovered by phospholipid. The uh, subtype of surfactant, large aggregate versus small vesicle surfactant. Amount of total protein associated with surfactant, and of course, the amount of SPB. And at baseline, before we gave any uh, therapy, these two groups uh, were uh, very well matched. And for example, here's SPB levels in the control and the treated. These uh, values are very similar to our previous studies looking at abnormal surfactant and much lower than a normal uh, surfactant. So it's a little complicated, but in this study we looked at the outcome, that is BPD or death at 36 weeks uh, postmenstrual age, uh, as a function of the amount of recovery of surfactant from the uh, air, airways. And we did a quartile analysis. This is the lowest level of surfactant recovered, and this is the highest. And we looked for treated, control, and both groups combined. And as you can see, there is a strong trend towards improved survival and less BPD at the higher levels of surfactant recovery. And this was a significant finding. The uh, samples with a lot of surfactant recovered had more SPB, so it was presumably more functional, and they had more, uh, had less total protein, which can be inhibitory for surfactant uh, function. So a brief summary of these and other data that I have not uh, presented uh, because of time. Uh, we think our data show that surfactant status uh, early in the neonatal course at one to three weeks is associated with respiratory outcome at uh, 36 weeks. The infants without BPD had uh, more large aggregate active surfactant. They had a higher content of SPB, lower content of total protein, and had a greater ratio actually of large to small uh, surfactant. So the problem with these infants in terms of their surfactant status is a deficiency in the amount of surfactant, dysfunction uh, if you have a low SPB, and inhibition by uh, total proteins. I did not show these data, but we found that late surfactant treatment transiently increases uh, both recovered surfactant and SPB content, but does not sustain these increased levels between the doses. And this may have uh, an impact on our uh, lack of benefit at uh, 36 weeks. Uh, these findings support a role of surfactant deficiency in SPB and perhaps suggest uh, some other different approaches uh, to uh, replacement therapy uh, later in the neonatal course, and maybe we can discuss that uh, later. So I'm going to talk, I'm going to go back now and talk about the, uh, the clinical part of this because part of what today is about is how difficult it is to take things from bench to bedside and how difficult it is to do, especially when you have the intervention of the FDA, um, to uh, actually uh, study something. So uh, going back to uh, what we did clinically in uh, Tolserf, uh, remember this is a late surfactant, so these were kids who were still intubated after seven days, and at the time, we were trying to do a multifactorial approach, and we thought that inhaled nitric oxide would help them. So they all got nitric oxide, and half of them got surfactant. Um, and our outcome was we were looking at 36 weeks because that's always been the standard. Uh, we looked there, but as secondary outcomes, we also looked to see what was going on in terms of need for support at term or 40 weeks. Uh, and we also said clinically important disease might have an effect over the first year or two. Um, the study was done between 2010 and 2013 at 25 centers, uh, and uh, the, uh, we had to screen almost uh, 2,700 infants uh, to find that 40% of them were still being uh, intubated and ventilated after seven days. I think that number has probably fallen now, but even at that time, people were trying not to have infants ventilated. Um, we had no difference in the treated or the controls in their mean birth weight, but note that uh, 
over 70% of them were less than 26 weeks. And so we are, as Alan said, we are focused in on these tiny kids. They're the ones who are giving us the most trouble at the moment. Um, and uh, there was no difference in birth weight or uh, the number who were uh, IUGR or male. Our outcome uh, is was survival without BPD at 36 uh, weeks. And as you see, we were able to get a completely balanced outcome, no difference whatsoever at uh, 36 weeks. Um, only 31% of these kids um, were surviving without BPD. However, if you looked at term at 40 weeks, which we think is taking out a lot of kids with control of breathing problems, uh, there you find that uh, there's a difference. And this is something that as we think about this together, you have to realize that, that at, at 36 weeks, only 31% would be called that, and at, at 40 weeks, 58% would be called uh, survival without BPD. What is it? What, what's going on in there? Uh, even if there's a background abnormality, we have to uh, address that. In addition, in other studies that we've looked at for a variety of reasons, we found that there was a difference in race response in this trial. So if you look, yes, the overall was 31, 32% survival, but in white infants, it was only 25% survival without BPD, whereas in the black infants, it was 37%. We don't have time to talk about this, but we are uh, publishing this year a paper showing that uh, in the nitric trials, it was the black infants who drove any responses. So what happened? Well, one question was, well, maybe they didn't have surfactant dysfunction, but Phil has just shown the data, they did. These infants did have surfactant dysfunction. Maybe the fact that we didn't enroll them so early. Maybe they, they were eight and a half days old before they got enrolled. Maybe there's already too much damage then. Maybe you can't do something then. Maybe we all have to focus earlier than that. And then, as Phil also mentioned, probably the dose and frequency was inadequate because we uh, would get a response and then the kid would slip backwards. Um, and maybe, as we've mentioned, 36 weeks isn't the best time to try to come out with something that talks about really meaningful long-term disease. And perhaps role, race plays a role. We're all interested in genetics, but we should be looking at uh, race as part of that look. We, as I mentioned, looked at one-year outcome in these infants, and uh, these were blinded quarterly uh, uh, questionnaires that were done at three, six, nine, and 12 months. We also have data from uh, the second year of life that we're in the process of trying to publish. Um, what we looked at was resource use, uh, realizing that it reflects the, uh, the therapy, not the underlying problem. But nevertheless, uh, did the kid get uh, home respiratory or oxygen support? Were they hospitalized? And uh, did they need uh, respiratory medications, uh, bronchodilators, diuretics, inhaled steroids, systemic steroids. At the time we did this trial, only a few infants were receiving uh, uh, pulmonary vasodilators, so uh, we did not find a signal that was uh, uh, valuable there. We looked to see how many infants uh, who were these very sick kids went home and had nothing in any of the first four quarters, so no pulmonary morbidity, and we looked at how many of them had persistent pulmonary morbidity, by which we arbitrarily define that as three out of four, three or four out of the four quarters, they had something of, of that group. And again, the, the bottom line here, what we found was actually a significant decrease in the number of infants who were in the treated group from 53 to 38 and a half percent who required home uh, oxygen or ventilatory support. So there was a significant change. Now, when you look at a lot of things, you could find a significant change. We also found a, su a strong suggestion when you uh, looked at, you corrected for baseline uh, abnormalities between the two groups, that there was probably a decreased persistent pulmonary morbidity. And we know from other studies that have been done of the uh, high-frequency ventilation and some others that longer term you may see changes in an intervention. And of course, the FDA has gotten very interested in how long we should look at these kids. But if you look 
to, uh, you know, they're, till they're 11, you will never make any progress with any of your new therapies. So we know that late surfactant had no effect on survival uh, without BPD at 36 weeks. There was a slight trend at 40 weeks, uh, and that 40 weeks might be a better indicator. We also learned, uh, and I didn't present the data, but the, it was a completely safe procedure, and the babies tolerated it well. And therefore, it could be a safe vehicle and uh, perhaps an improvement uh, to deliver medication. Now, the, I, I mentioned that it could be a vehicle, and I think that's where we go to what we're thinking about uh, for next, which is the potential of using surfactant as a delivery vehicle to deliver um, whatever we want to give to the lung directly to the lung. And this is, uh, Ye has already published, uh, Professor Ye from Taiwan has published two studies, two pilot studies of uh, putting budesonide so that we could deliver uh, steroid directly to the lung without the same level of uh, systemic uh, involvement. Um, we know that this is a safe procedure. However, so why do we need more? Why isn't it just enough that he's done these two and seen dramatic improvement in BPD? Well, there are several problems with his studies. The first uh, is that we really need some big randomized controlled trials. His studies were not blinded, neither at the time of treatment nor for follow-up. Uh, his population was severe RDS, up to 1,500 grams. And we all know, as Alan mentioned, that a lot of the kids who end up with the current uh, BPD don't really have too much going on at the beginning, partly because of their antenatal steroids, partly because of their uh, surfactant, but they aren't really very sick. Um, but then they get um, into trouble. We also think uh, there's an issue uh, that we know that if kids are still needing significant respiratory support or intubation after two to three days, uh, that those kids are at very high risk of death or BPD. We're, and we're trying to avoid giving steroids to kids who don't need it. Um, uh, I think that that means we should look at different approaches to this. The, uh, he also used Cervanta, which does not have very much surfactant protein B in it, and there are other probably surfactants that would work better. And the dose, he used a high dose. And from the studies that we did, uh, uh, both with some uh, lambs that we did with Kurt uh, Albertine, as well as the studies uh, done in Phil's lab with lung explants, we found that possibly the dose was 10 times higher than it needs to be uh, to get a maximal response. And so we're concerned, since we have a history of concern about giving steroids uh, and uh, eventual neurological outcome. And we also think that his redosing, based on some studies with cytokines, was too soon, but that some kids who remain intubated probably need to be retreated. So as a result of that, uh, with Cindy McAvoy, uh, we're doing currently a dose escalation uh, study to try to get the best dose that we might use in a trial. It's being funded by Thrasher. And uh, Cindy and I are now working on putting together a, uh, a large multicenter trial uh, with uh, the, D, uh, the DCC based at the University of Washington. And our study aims for that uh, would be to look at the efficacy and safety of budesonide in surfactant. Uh, in infants who are still requiring significant support between two and three days and up to 14 days, uh, and to look at outcome at 40 weeks uh, as well as 12, 12 and 24 months. We also would like to use this as an opportunity. Our uh, biostatisticians are excited about the possibility that we can find some earlier um, score, scoring issues that would help us with this. Um, as I mentioned, that's the group we're going to look at. We would retreat every 24 to 36 hours up to five doses, which is what we did in Tulsurf, but more frequently. Uh, and uh, we're hoping to do that. So from our point of view, from doing bench to bedside, attempting to move forward on studies, um, the end next uh, is uh, how do we measure clinically meaningful improved respiratory uh, disease. What is that? Is it, 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 I suspect it's beyond 36 weeks 
uh, how long does it have to be, but that's something that many of us are grappling with now. How do we do that? The second thing is really important to all of you who are trying to develop interventions. How do we identify which of the problems these infants have that could be causing them to require support at 36 or 40 weeks? That could be control of breathing or a weak chest wall. That could be pulmonary hypertension. That could be parenchymal lung disease. That could be airway disease. How do we know which that is? And maybe if Bill Northway could just put his mind on this, we could find a radiological way of sorting this one out uh, again. And then how do we tailor this to the individual? Is it race? Uh, we're going to hear more about a variety of approaches here in omics and so forth. And uh, how, do, how do we go from here? Uh, obviously, we have to thank many people, particularly NHLBI, who stuck with us uh, for this 40 years, um, and many, many collaborators who've been important to us over the years. Uh, we also want you to know that we now uh, have a writing and thinking retreat in Bodega Bay, California, where you're welcome to come and join us um, uh, to toss this around and try to solve the problem.